The Tale of Darren P. Murchison Ancient Greek mythology tells the origin story of the birth of mankind. Created with clay by the titan Prometheus. Cousin of Olympic god Zeus, Prometheus also returned the flare of the eternal fire from Mount Olympus to his beloved mankind, denied to them by a pissed off Zeus, after Prometheus thought it would be a great joke to serve up his cousin a really crappy meal. Disgraced former country fire authority volunteer, Darren P. Murchison was the fifth son of State Electricity Commission boilermaker, Murray Murchison, and palliative care nurse, Mary Murchison. Growing up in the rural town of Churchill, at the base of the Strzelecki Ranges in Victoria's La Trobe Valley, Darren would often be bullied by his older, stronger brothers, Morgan, Michael, Martin, and Murray Jr. When not torturing him, the brothers would facilitate and encourage him to do reckless and dangerous stunts on their property, or in the surrounding bushland. Supplying the child, with flammable goods or explosives. While never enjoying being forced to do anything, a trait which also hindered his cognitive development, Darren was mesmerized by fire. Armed with a lighter, Stolen from inside his dad's packet of ransom select cigarettes, five-year-old Darren began his lifelong career as an arsonist. He only had a full ten and a half years before he could join the CFA as a volunteer, lighting fires. He was just smart enough to realize he better get practicing. The easiest targets were the first to go. The family hay shed their paddock of next season's hay, ready for harvest. Tony Stewart's hay shed, then old Johnny Marriott's hay shed. Suspecting at least a teenager was responsible, Darren was able to fly under the radar. That is until he began primary school. Suspicious fires soon gave way to full-view daylight blazes. The cricket oval, during a match against Traralgon Primary. The wooden play equipment. And tan bark trees. The drama hut, during an Easter performance for parents. Finally, three quarters of the school building. Darren was sporadically homeschooled by his mother, from then on. But politely, his teenage years were a train wreck. His mother was forced to fail him each consecutive homeschooled secondary year, due to his lack of attendance. Because of his age, reputation, and sustained petty arson, he was now gaining the attention of local police. At a town hall meeting, a shoot to kill law was agreed upon if Darren was seen near any neighboring properties. The teenagers who attended school would hurl abuse and physically assault him if he ever dared go into town. Darren was completely socially retarded. He'd without fail, wear black clothing, was overweight, had a neckbeard and would always breathe heavily, with his mouth constantly open. Also, for an undiagnosed cause, he constantly smelt of a mixture of one-week-old delicatessen meats, combined with rancid fish sauce. But his 16th birthday was just around the corner. And he could finally become a volunteer firestarter at the CFA. On his first day as a trainee cadet at the Churchill CFA, Darren presumed he would have to keep his love of starting fires a closely guarded secret. However, by lunchtime that day, Darren had discovered his entire CFA fire starting crew were either arsonists, or suspected arsonists. Private Graham Code, just one year older than Darren, had started the horrifically devastating Stratford Inferno, in his dad's paddock two seasons past with just a single match and one sheet of bog roll. While Captain Kruznarik, the most senior, experienced, and battle-hardened of the group, was the proud cause of the Great Morwell Mine Fire, which burned for three years, 
and resulted in the evacuation of the town. Darren was inspired, and desperate to impress them. That night, in his single bed, following his nightly routine, he chuckled to himself out loud, as he devised his next burn. That year, the town of Churchill was celebrating the 150th anniversary of European settlement. The primary school kiddies had all been forced to construct a Churchill-themed diorama, with the best 25 of them to be paraded down the main street. They were being stored in a clubhouse on the school grounds. The morning of the parade, Darren planned to break into the clubhouse, then using just a magnifying glass, focused the sun onto the diorama collection. Fixing his black balaclava, forcing open the window, straining to lift himself up, then crashing onto the floor, Darren had never conceived that the only window in the hut faced west. It was 10 a.m. He decided to get comfortable, eat two Chocito bars, take a nap, and wait it out. At midday, wheezing and comatose, Darren was suddenly woken by the sound of the door being opened. Some local kids had a key to the clubhouse and were coming in to collect their dioramas. Darren literally shut himself, scampered up, and with his full weight ran through the group of children, scattering them like skittles, before they had fully entered. He kept running, without looking back, off into the bush. The children's descriptions of Darren varied, but his physical encounter with them left a lasting impression, earning him the nicknames, Mr. Sooty, Mr. Stinky, and Fish Fingers. Later, stumbling out of the bush near his home, and still wearing his black balaclava, Darren was spotted by a police car cresting the highway. They pulled up beside him. While not under arrest, Darren was asked if he wouldn't mind coming back to the station, to answer a few questions. He grudgingly started walking to their four-wheel drive. All the while huffing and puffing, and then making a noise like an annoyed horse, as he climbed in and sat down. <laughs> Arriving at the station, and instantly regretting closing the interview room door, due to the steaming funk emanating from Darren's paws, one constable began the interview by asking Darren what the piece stood for in his name. I don't know, he replied. It was his honest answer. Darren was sweating like a pig, in a plastic suit, on a hot day. The policemen's eyes were literally burning red, and weeping. They were forced to dispense with the interview after just one question, for want of fresh air. Darren was free to go. Two years passed. Sporadic reports of fires suspected to be lit by Mr. City continued. Darren was now 18, and had risen to the rank of senior trainee cadet at the CFA. He had also gained his truck license, which had greatly increased his range of possible arson targets. The big one was how Darren would think of his ultimate fire crime. Requiring logistics, forethought and a knowledge of meteorology well beyond his neurological capacity, Darren planned to harness a northerly wind on a hot summer's day to set the northern Victorian Alps ablaze. Then, time to perfection, before the cool change, race south to the Strzelecki Ranges and set them ablaze. Both fire fronts would then combine, to wipe out the entire 1,426 square kilometres of the Latrobe Valley. Sweet. On February the 4th, after a week-long heatwave, and hot northerly winds, a southerly cool change and possible thunderstorm was predicted in the afternoon. It was perfect. The night before, Darren broke into the CFA training compound, filled a water tanker up with diesel, and drove it back home. At 8am, after sleeping in, he headed off, up into the northern bush tracks. Destination, Mount Buller. Of course, every other arsonist in the valley and surrounding towns had a similar idea. The closer he got to Mount Buller, the worse the traffic got. Dirt bikes, four-wheel drives, 
and utes with trays loaded with petrol containers. Finally, climbing and rounding a bend, Darren came across a fuel tanker, stopping all traffic. It was attempting to do a 17-point turn, on a treacherously steep, single-vehicle track cutting. Darren cracked it. He decided to dump the water tanker down the hillside. It lacked a functioning handbrake, so he jumped out, and placed wheel chocks, connected by a rope, behind the rear tires. He climbed back into the vehicle, put the transmission in neutral, then jumped back out and bent down, farting at the same time, to grab the rope. Standing directly behind the steeply inclined, diesel-filled water tanker, Darren yanked on the rope. For the past 22 years, Darren P. Murchison has been living on a disability support pension, in a converted NDIS-funded unit to suit his needs, on his parents' property. The water tanker incident destroyed his liver, C5, and C6 vertebrae, resulting in paraplegia below the pelvis, and the complete loss of control of bladder and bowel function. Continued and worsening difficulties breathing, requires the constant use of a respirator, causing him to sound like Darth Vader. <laughs>